10 years ago. If you were an anime fan, you were watching the first season of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. What? You didn't watch anime back then? Sure, you're excused. Now. And those of you that didn't watch it back then, what was wrong with you? Now I know what you're going to say. What do you mean, 10 years ago? Has it really been that long? Yes. Yes, it has been. Ah, oh, shit. Back in 2012, not many Western anime fans knew about JoJo. But times have changed, as simply evident by Part 6 airing on Netflix as an exclusive. And pretty much every anime watcher has at least heard of it now. Back then, not many people in the West even knew about JoJo's. Despite it being referenced everywhere, it was nothing more than an obscure old manga from 1987, and that one OVA adaption from the 90s, which was basically just Stardust Crusader's best hits animated. So people were surprised to hear in the summer of 2012 that Jojo would get a new anime adaptation that year's fall season, and even more surprised that the studio said it would commit to adapting all of the manga, eight parts spanning almost four decades of material. Wait, what do you mean Araki just started part 9 last week? Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> People were surprised and cautiously optimistic, because the studio adapting it to David Productions was fairly new and did mostly supporting work in anime, and the studio had a lot of material to get through, making it a very long time investment. But however, it was a massive hit, and it is now easily one of the more popular and well-known series out there. At least in the West. In Japan it was always famous, seeing it get referenced in every media out there. The anime probably came out in the right time, since meme culture on the internet was getting quite big, and the series itself provides a ton of memeable scenes and phrases, probably helping in its spread and popularity as fast as it did. It also stood out a bit in its art style, as most of the anime around the time, and now, is mainly focused on the appeal of Moe. Moe. Unless you think cross-dressing Joseph is Moe, then, well, more power to you, I'm not judging. At first, some people weren't sure if it would be popular in this era of anime, but the studio hit a home run. However, over the years, some people have come to criticize the first season of Jojo, mostly the first part, Phantom Blood, resulting in some people coming up with things more bizarre than the actual anime is. For example, different watching orders. Now, I might be crazy, but I'm not that crazy. Recently, I ended up re-watching the first season of Jojo, but is the first season really that bad? And specifically, is Phantom Blood really that bad? Let's take a look, now 10 years later, at the first season of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. The anime makes no time to introduce us to the main characters right away. Jonathan Joestar, the first of many Jojos, and a charismatic asshole Dio Brando. And after only one episode, Jonathan lost his friends, his 2B girlfriend, and his dog dies, all thanks to Dio. Why does the dog have to die, you ask? I don't know. Araki must secretly hate him, as this happens a lot in the series. Despite the series name, part 1 is really just a Dio show. Jonathan is not the most interesting character around sadly, and wants to do one thing, and one thing only, to be a gentleman. And that happens to go inside with preventing Dio from ruining the world. In later interviews, Araki stated he wanted to write Dio's character originally, so maybe that's why Jonathan is slightly one more dimensional. I wouldn't have minded seeing Dio's bizarre adventure though, but maybe it's good to have Jonathan in there to counter Dio's over the top antics before it goes off rails too much. Dio is voiced by Takahito Koyasu, and despite the man having voiced in over 400 anime in the past 30 years, and quite a few shows which I saw before Jojo, I always end up associating him with Dio the most. The man clearly enjoys voicing the character and puts a lot of energy in his performance, and ends up stealing the show. And with something wildly hilarious in the fact that he says Egypt is his favorite country. As part one goes on, we get introduced to the supporting cast, consisting of Sabelli and Speedwagon. Hey, baby. Speedwagon, while a bro, does nothing really more than exposition dump for the audience and describes what happens during fights. Then Sabelli lives to teach Jonathan the ways of the Hammond, an energy attack that can kill vampires created by the Stone Mask, before he dies an untimely death before the final showdown. Ah right, the Stone Mask. The ancient Aztec relic Dio used to become an immortal vampire which granted him all kinds of powers you can think of. Freezing powers, turning people into his servants, shooting beams from his eyes, you name it. Pretty much anything goes here. Shortly after Sabelli's demise, we get introduced to the Dire Straits. Um, I mean Diamond Strazo. Strazo doesn't really do anything and only seems to exist for the part 2 setup, and Dio only exists to deliver his ultimate and then promptly being iced off by Dio when it fails. The climactic fight between Dio and Jonathan takes place, 
but he survives barely, and comes back later as a hat, because why not, despite Jonathan's and Arina's honeymoon trip to the States. Jonathan defeats Dio once and for all, right? Right? And drags him to the bottom of the sea on a sinking ship, while Arina gets away in a coffin Dio's to get on board, together with the baby she picked up to continue the Joestar plotline in America. And that is part one, all of it. There isn't really much more to it, it is that short. And this is where I don't get the complaint of people who don't want to watch part one. It is about three hours long, all things considered, and it can be watched in one evening if you sit down for it, especially consider how long later part of Jojo get episode-wise. Is it the best part of Jojo? On a technical level? No, not by a long shot, but I still enjoy it, and it was definitely worse anime out there. Koyasu's performance of Dio easily carries part one for me, and it is an entertaining but short, good looking and sounding production, and just a fun time overall. However, it feels that part 1 is just setting up stuff that is to come in later parts. Speaking of which, luckily the first season had more left up its sleeve. Where part 1 is more of a Victorian drama with some horror elements, part 2 is more of an 80s action movie where they travel all over the world, much like Indiana Jones. And as it happens, I love those movies. Unlike Jonathan, who was a boring gentleman, Joseph is actually a fun and interesting character. He is a hothead who likes to taunt his enemies, think of ridiculous strategies, and doesn't mind making use of whatever he can in order to win the fight. I knew I was in for something good as soon as he showed us a famous Joestar technique of running the fuck away. <laughs> Initially spurred into action by the betrayal of strays of becoming a vampire, Joseph sets out traveling the world to save the disappeared speedwagon, a close friend to him and the Joestar family. Running into Nazi soldiers on the way, up to no good and digging up ancient vampires thinking it could help them in the war. After saving Speedwagon and getting rid of a vampire named Satana, uh, Sanfienta? Okay, it's time to point out that a lot of the character names have been changed in the Master release because a lot of them are famous music groups or singers. And in order to stay out of hot water with localizing the series, the majority of the names have been changed throughout the series. But you can't really fool anyone when the characters actually say something completely different in the subtitles. Send Fiant on my ass. Anyway, after that Joseph sets out to Europe and goes to Italy, a place we will return to later in this franchise, and takes chase after the awakened Pillman with his new best friend Caesar Sapelli, descendant of William Sapelli, who helped out Jonathan in part 1. And who are all the Pillman, you ask? Well, they are only the most manly men to have ever existed in any fictional story. <laughs> Despite Joseph immediately pissing them off and nearly getting killed by them, he manages to bullshit his way out of it, arranging an agreement to give him 30 days to get stronger, strong enough to even defeat them. This stupidly enough works thanks to Wamu, the one who almost killed him, being an idiot who suffers of what we call honor. After this, Caesar takes Joseph to his old master, Lisa Lisa, who, without knowing us at first, turns out to be his mother, and the baby that got saved during Jonathan's final confrontation with Dio on the ship. After 20 days of splashing about in oil, Joseph gets confronted by the first of the three pillarmen in his beat, ACDC, and he defeats him, leaving nothing but his brain, but he's only really destroyed with the combined power of him and Caesar. But not before Joseph spied on his naked mother taking bot, however. Oh my, Joseph Goon. Nice. <laughs> During the first scuffle, the magical MacGuffin, the Red Son of Adja, got chipped off to Switzerland, and the group needs to follow after it. After an encounter with a certain German officer he met in Mexico, and Cass, the leader of the Pillman, Caesar loses his life in an abandoned hotel because he thought it would be a good idea to run an angry to face Wamo on his own. The next time this series introduces his belly, I will be famous for the life, unless Iraqi decides to throw in a curveball. Rip Caesar, you are a good boy, you deserve better than this. After that, the final battle of part 2 starts, and Joseph fights the two remaining pillarmen with renewed energy. After fumbling his way through the fight with Wamu, Kar shows his true colors and manages to obtain the aforementioned Stone of Aja, and uses that to transform into the ultimate creature. Now immortal and unstoppable, Joseph relies on the old family technique of running away and leaps in an airplane. Angered by this, Kars follows him, all the way to a volcano off the coast of Italy. With the German officer Strom showing up in the last minute and helping Joseph, Kars gets launched into space. Unable to die and unable to get back to Earth, Kars refers back to a stone once again and drifts away in space for all of eternity, and the world is saved. And with that, part 2 comes to a conclusion. 
We get some nice closure for the chapters of this part. Aaron and Speedwagon pass away due to old age, and Joseph gets married. And at the end of the season we see him leave to Japan, setting up defense for part 3. While we see a mysterious figure in the prison, and a coffin being fished out from the bottom of the ocean, telling us Dio is still alive. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait a minute. Then there's a coffin Aaron escaped it at the end of part 1. How is there another coffin? Does Dio have spares for some reason? Now, Rocky, what were you doing? Did you forget? But with all that, the first season of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure comes to an end. Overall, part 2 is much better than part 1, and if it wasn't for it, I doubt I would have been a fan of the franchise today. As I said earlier, part 1 isn't bad, but it is lacking in a lot of aspects. But it was great humor, good fights, and it's a fun time all around. Also a quick mention of the series soundtrack. Season 1 consists of 4 separate soundtracks, 2 for each part, with an average of 23 songs in each of them. Part 1 has a more classical soundtrack, with some suspenseful and heroic sounding themes. Part 2 soundtrack has a well-known awake, used in many a meme, and great pieces like Avalon, and my personal favorite, Welcome to the World. It really is amazing how much good tracks the soundtrack for part 2 consists of, despite it only having 16 episodes. Even more so for part 1 with 49 songs stuffed into this short duration, resulting into every minute having a piece of music, leaving nothing unused. All of this kept off by two openings, the now iconic Sono Chino Sadame, and still my favorite Jojo opening to date, Bloody Storm, and the progressive rock classic Roundabout by Yes as an ending team. So I was pretty hyped up for the adaptation of part 3 that was coming a year later, as many people were. But that is a story for the next video, where we discuss part 3 of Jojo, Stardust Crusaders. This is Mina Masora, and thank you all for watching, and hope to see you next time.